So everyone uh, probably knows by now, my name is Josaura. Um, I am the ABCT program chair, and I'm really excited to be with everyone today. Um, I am gonna be sharing some slides in a second, but first I wanted to give you a little background about me for those of you who don't know me, because I know we have a lot of SIG leaders here, SIG members, um, even board members here in this call. So um, I am a clinical psychologist, um, an associate professor at the Medical University of South Carolina. And really when I was a little kid, I, I wanted to really help kids get access to mental health care in Puerto Rico. And it was just very apparent that there weren't a lot of opportunities to get that type of training in Puerto Rico or to get access to those services. So I've dedicated my entire career to that. Um, I come from a lens of my multiple identities. So as a female Latina scientist whose primary culture is not in the mainland US, and who grew up in a very collectivistic, community-oriented um, life. Uh, I'm all about transparency, sharing knowledge, co-creating. Um, so that's the philosophy I bring to my role. Um, and in part of that, I realized when I was a grad student, I was introduced to ABCT. And I really didn't know how to navigate much of the submission process. Um, I learned from other grad students in my lab and faculty in my program who had been through the process. And that kind of made me wonder what happens for grad students, professors who are not plugged in already and how do they get access to this information? And fast forward many years, now we have a really cool website, more access to information, but still there's a lot of um, questions about who gets accepted into convention, who doesn't, what are the criteria? So I'm going to share the kind of overview of how we got here and then important updates that are relevant for you all to know for this year um, so that everyone's on the same page. That's really the goal for today. I'm going to share my slides and these um, I have a QR at the end where you can get access to these slides. OK, um, if you want at any point and please do don't wait till the end. Um, plug in your questions or comments in the chat. Everyone is muted just so that we minimize background noise, but I can unmute you if you want. All right, cool. So first of all, I believe in the importance of acknowledging that this is not just me, it's a team. I'm just representing the team today. So I just want to thank the wonderful ladies um, you see here, including my um, program co-chair, um, Dr. Emily Thomas. And I also want to acknowledge um, ABCT staff behind the scenes, Stephen Crane, who's our convention manager, Dakota McPherson, who's our membership and marketing manager, and Dr. Katie Balcom, who's our rep at large and basically takes what we talk about to the board. And the board talks about things and takes it back to us. So she's an amazing collaborator in that regard. Um, and to all of you for being here today. The agenda is to first, like, this is the summary of the ABCT town hall that we had January 26. For those of you who are not sure what I'm talking about, I'll be sharing a QR code with the link to the YouTube video. But basically, we wanted to share current procedures on convention submission and acceptance and elicit feedback from members, past reviewers on what works, what doesn't, and what needs to change. Then I'm gonna share how after that, in the last three weeks, we've incorporated um, feedback into this year's convention and then um, create a space for next steps and what we'll have to wait until 2023, but with the hopes of that information being translated to the next program committee. I always like to start with some suggested agreements and this one, I'm gonna be a little vulnerable here. Um, other than raising your hand, if you wanna ask a question and writing it on the chat, um, please be patient with me. I think there's a lot of myths about program chairs and what we know. Like the, the reality is we learn our role as we go. So I'm learning still. And I also acknowledge I have blind spots. So perhaps I'm missing something and I welcome your feedback. Um, but I appreciate it in a very kind and mindful way. Um, I also want us to be mindful of power differentials in the room. We might have graduate students here. We might have um, distinguished faculty here who shaped our field. Be mindful of how much 
space we're taking up and if diverse representation of voices are speaking up or just the same folks. Um, and let's just be respectful of each other's views. Um, I really want to encourage that in particular so that we can come to solutions. So to recap, on January 26, we had a town hall where all membership could join um, like this. Um, and we had, uh, the topic was transparency and review. How to, like an open discussion with you all about convention submissions and decisions. And really it was hoping to demystify and improve our process with membership feedback and increase access to information. We had 101 members attend. Um, you can scan that QR code for the YouTube um, recording and watch it if you'd like. Um, and overall, uh, we got really positive feedback about the importance of having these transparent, open conversations and dialogue, because convention really should be about membership. Um, that's why we're here and also about how we're impacting the field together as a team. Um, so I'm just going to jump right to it. I'm a qualitative researcher at heart. I am, operate from a community-based participatory framework. So here I am sharing the findings and the summary of the comments. Um, and then I'm going to show the same table with what we're doing about it. So the first thing that came up was um, a concern with the representation of diverse individuals at different career stages in convention programming. And in particular, concerns were brought up about underrepresentation of women, in particularly more prestigious conference roles and prestigious conference times. Um, along those lines, a very significant concern of year after year diversity related topics being overrepresented in the Sunday slots, which we know are tricky because many people have to travel back home or perhaps don't stay until the end. Um, implications for senior career presenters in the decision making process, meaning this um, feedback that was given in a prior convention about more symposia with more senior folks and how that impacts early career and grad students in these opportunities to present their work, um, which may be still cutting edge innovative work. And then there's no really data to analyze pre, like who submits and who gets accepted. Um, Dr. Laura Sokol has done an amazing job over the years presenting data post hoc, looking at program and coding the program. But recognizing as a good scientist, that's not good. That's not at all the picture. We need more data. Another um, theme that came up was SIG sponsorship. SIG's feeling in general like their sponsorships are not being taken into consideration. Um, there's some SIGs that feel like, yeah, consistently we get about, you know, 50% acceptance. Like one submission gets accepted, the other doesn't. And some SIGs feeling like, we almost feel like when we sponsor something, it doesn't get accepted. What is that about? Another concern was RCTs being the gold standard of evidence. And in particular, colleagues who do quality improvement work, which has a lot of real world implications, real time implications, feeling like where, where do, how is that weighted? And what is the role that this plays into ticketed accept, submission acceptances, right? And also, what does this imply for novel treatments with diverse global populations that perhaps have not gotten to the point of an RCT or where it's not feasible? Case in point, I do a lot, I, Rosara, do a lot of post disaster work um, where it's unethical to assign someone to immediate assistance versus no, you don't get anything, right? So, what do you do with that? Um, another concern brought up was potential for reviewer bias, meaning Reviewers historically at ABCT, unlike for manuscripts, have not been blind um, mass to review. Um, and you notice my self-correction of blind, blind, the use of the word blind. Um, our membership even mentioned that is in, in unsensitive language. It should be masked. So I apologize for making that mistake. And then um, an overall like question mark, can we mass reviews? Is there a way to perhaps um, minimize bias um, where we're basing it on the science, on the data, on what this submission is presenting? Um, and then um, reviewers themselves said it would be nice to have a guide. 
I feel like I interpret the criteria in one way, but maybe my colleagues and others, it would be nice to have a tip sheet, a short video guiding us through the expectations of review, similar to what study sections at NIH get or SAMHSA review panels. And then um, some members said, would it be possible to get feedback on why my presentation was not accepted? I also met with um, individual SIGs, individual members that reached out to me as program chair. Um, and so the dissemination implementation SIG brought some concerns about how do we integrate multiple voices into clinical roundtables, panels, discussions, meaning yes, researchers are important, clinicians are important, but what about consumers, persons with lived experience of mental illness, community stakeholders? Um, and how could we perhaps incentivize participation of these stakeholders into a convention, meaning some of the biggest barriers are financial um, upon return to an uh, in-person um, convention. What do we do about that? Um, the DISIG also brought up, um, they've been doing this great um, cross-collaboration um, SIG sponsorship where they kind of act as matchmakers for multiple SIGs to submit cross-collaboration presentations. However, historically, each SIG gets two sponsored slots, which means that one of the SIGs co cross-collaborating gives up that spot. Could there be a designated cross-collaboration spot that the DISIG could help facilitate? Um, and then there was some concern about Again, who is presenting? What are the representation of diverse voices and backgrounds? And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second because the um, sexual and gender minority SIG had some representatives had some phenomenal suggestions. All right, so what do we do? What we met, we took this feedback, our committee, um, uh, anyone in charge of programming, and we discussed and we sat with it. And so, Regarding the first one, we have a couple of changes this year um, and some suggestions for next year. So we, I am a big proponent of not reinventing the wheel and honoring other expertise that perhaps I might not have. Um, I, full disclosure, I'm a member of the International um, Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. I'm their social media coordinator. And I'm also um, a member of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. So I reached out to my colleagues who have in the past done a phenomenal job in their conferences, um, compiling pre-post data, pre-data on presenters and their diverse voices and backgrounds. And with their permission, we adapted these questions and have added them to the ABCT portal, which I'll be showing you in a second. So now presenters will be able to voluntarily, and we'll talk about this in a second, um, enter information about their career stage, um, academic setting, time spent in clinical research and training, among other questions um, about multiple intersecting identities, so that we can finally analyze these data in aggregated form to establish a baseline of who is submitting to ABCT and ultimately who gets accepted. Now, this year, this data will be used as an exploratory pilot data. We will not be sharing that with reviewers for two reasons. One is we cannot um, start an action plan implementing integration of those data without really understanding at baseline where we're at with the process currently. Um, so I hope folks kind of understand that that's where we're coming from. Um, but in the future, the idea would be for these data to be made available to reviewers to be factored in to their considerations. Um, so I just wanted to start right there. And those questions um, were where the sexual and gender minority say gave us some important feedback about separating different identities. And I'll show you that in a second. The second thing that we sat down and thought about was six sponsorship. Um, and so really, there were several proposals thrown out, equally valid. Why don't SIG sponsorships get accepted automatically? That's one idea. Or could we add a weight to SIG sponsorship? Ultimately, our committee um, sat down and talked about this. And we decided that for this year, we will definitely be taking SIG sponsorship very seriously. Every single sponsorship will be um, evaluated in its own merit. However, um, a, our compromise is that the composite reviewer scores 
um, of three or more, the scales are zero to four, I'll show you that in a second, will automatically accept it. By the way, a three is good in a scale from poor, adequate, good, excellent, okay? So if that sponsorship passes our reviewer test of on average three or above on all the quality ratings, automatic acceptance. Um, if not, we will carefully review, examine, and determine if we could potentially include some SIG sponsorships regardless, even if they're a little bit lower, but they fit other criteria. Um, in the future, this is still not like a good plan. SIGs don't feel that it ended up in positive results, meaning let's look at the data. Do we have more representation of SIG sponsorship using this method? If not, it didn't work. So we'll need to revise with the 2023 committee. Um, the reason we did not do an automatic acceptance is that would require standardization of review criteria that SIGs use. So um, I think we're not there yet. Concerns about RCTs being the gold standard. Um, I agree, that's a big gap. And um, we want to remind folks when they're submitting that the evidence doesn't have to come from your team. If you're using an evidence-based protocol, evidence-based principle with prior um, strong data from other teams, you can incorporate that into your current QI work. However, we recognize this doesn't fully address the issue. So um, we welcome further suggestions on this. Potential for reviewer bias. Um, this is a newbie this year. We will be masking all submissions. Reviewers will be completely unaware of who submitted what, um, and quality ratings will be based on the science, the data, the, the strength of the presentations, and I'll be sharing review criteria soon. We also added a contributing team question where um, the submitter is the submission people, whoever, you know, the team, um, is is, needs to write a de-identified description of their team and what they bring to the table in terms of expertise. And I'll be sharing an example of that in a second. This is just an overview of the findings. Um, training for reviewers, Emily and I will be creating a short training video with a reviewer criteria and a guide, and that will be disseminated in the upcoming weeks. The reviewer criteria will also be made public on the IBCT website. So submitters, just like you submit an NIH grant, a SAMHSA grant, you know what the criteria are ahead of time, we will be um, posting the review criteria. Submission feedback, currently unfeasible to give feedback to thousands of presentations on why they were accepted or not. This is one where I really could not find a solution for this year. And we'll need to sit with that on how how, do, how can we make some sort of feedback happen that is feasible given our staff constraints and um, the reality of what that means um, in terms of labor? Um, importance of diverse voices and perspectives in roundtables and panels. Um, we've amended the description to clinical roundtables and panels in particular in two ways. What's I, um, what you see kind of highlighted there in italics is new. Um, so we've expanded the definition of panelists presenters in these two types of submissions to include not just researchers and clinicians, but can include voices from community stakeholders, consumers, and persons with lived experience of mental illness. Um, this is going to require a lot of, um, you know, in the importance of the person who's organizing the panel or the clinical roundtable to safeguard um, that person with lived experience of mental illness so that they feel safe, supported, and also that we minimize a voyeuristic approach to this, but rather a person who is stable, who's received evidence-based treatment, and who really wants to share their experience and is and feel supported to do so. So we need to be really mindful to protect the public in this regard. Um, and then we've expanded the focus of um, clinical roundtables and panels in which we encourage submissions in which researchers can discuss data and then clinicians, community stakeholders can have a conversation about how has that really worked in the real world? What are some of the challenges, barriers? How can we engage in those cross collaborations, conversations, where it's not the research informing from a top-down approach, but also from a 
you know, community to research or conversation. And I definitely want to um, thank the sexual and gender minority SIG um, for coming up with that idea and the DIS SIG for um, also independently coming up with that idea. Um, I'm going to uh, say that for the cross collaboration DIS SIG um, idea, at the end, I'll be opening up for comment. I really want to hear what other SIGs think about this. Um, so I have not made a decision about that or my committee. We're open to it. I think it's a cool idea, but I want to be mindful that maybe I have not considered unintended consequences that other SIGs might see from this. To clarify, the proposal is proposal is on the table. The dissemination implementation SIG will have three slots. Two that they sponsor just like anyone else, one that their stewards are of where they invite multiple SIGs to collaborate on a presentation of any kind and then put their stamp of approval with that designated slot. That's the proposal on the table. All right. So um, I promise you we're gonna get to Q&A soon. I'm wrapping up. I just wanna kind of orient everyone to what's, what the changes are so we can have an opportunity to comment. First things first. <laughs> Um, and I didn't know this, so I'm glad I'm learning. That's why I'm sharing it. I thought that I had to have all my submission materials presentation ready to go in order to go into the submission portal to submit. This is a myth. And it's a good myth that we um, kind of break down. You can log in today, right, Stephen? You can log in as many times as you want. You can come back to it. It'll be saved. Please log in. And the reason for that is in there, you'll see everything that's required, all the instructions, and you can start thinking, okay, I need to like give a heads up to my presenters that we'll need to do this. I need to like make sure I have these documents in order. So I have homework for you. Log in today and I'll show you the site in a second. The link is also included in the presentation. It can also be accessed by going to abct.org, convention tab, preparing to submit an abstract and you get straight to the page. Um, the other thing is um, for submitters, like this is the person usually organizing the type of presentation being submitted, symposia, clinical roundtable. Know that this year, the when you enter your presenters, that creates a profile as it always has, and you enter their name, their address or degree, but there's a list of demographic and diversity questions that you should not be filling out. You should be clicking invite and I will show you the button and that'll send an automatic email for your presenters to complete those questions on a volunteer basis. Meaning if the presenter does not complete them, you could still submit. Meaning that if you don't know the answer to those questions, you don't want to assume or make stuff up or enter it. Not saying anyone would do that, but to be mindful that we want to make sure people have agency in identifying their multiple identities, their backgrounds, or choosing not to do so. This is the data that we will be um, analyzing in aggregate form for those who volunteer. And finally, I'll be pointing in a second to the three new questions to um, complete in the portal. They're pretty easy. Um, rather than in the past, reviewers have had to look at the submission and interpret the relevance to the convention theme, interpret the relevance to ABCT mission and goals. We've decided to ask submitters to write a few sentences on why this fits with the convention, if, if it does, and what it does to fit with ABCT mission and goals. So reviewers can actually see data as opposed to interpret it from the submission, the abstracts. So let's go through it. When you log into the submission portal, anything that I'm highlighting in yellow is new. It's not much, but I, I want you to be mindful that clinical roundtables have some new descriptions that you should become familiarized with, mainly who you can include in your roundtable and an additional thing that we're encouraging folks to think about including in their submissions if they, they have good ideas for that. I've already discussed that, so I'm gonna move on, but you'll get these slides. And then panel discussions, the, the definition of what is an informed individual has been expanded. That's it. The rest stays the same for now. But I want to go back. 
Because even in my own committee, my own like program committee, some of us were like, oh, I didn't know that there were more than symposia at ABCT. I forgot. So yes, my friends, clinical roundtables are a great opportunity to bring amazing minds together from all these different perspectives to discuss. And this is the important difference between a clinical roundtable and a panel directly related to patient care, treatment, or the application, implementation of a treatment, okay? That's really important. That's what a clinical roundtable is about. Now, a panel discussion is still a discussion among the kind of the same stakeholders, mostly researchers though, and it's pertaining to a topic that is conceptual in nature. Um, I remember by like, you know, seeing an amazing panel discussion between like different um, leaders of evidence-based practices that we all teach and, and having a debate of what, how do we really define exposure? Something simple like that, right? Or how do we really define compet culturally competent supervision, right? So that would be more of a panel discussion, okay? But please read the descriptions. Symposia are what we're, we're used to thinking about ABCT, right? As a group of usually like, you know, four to six presentations, papers, data-driven, empirical research discussions. Um, but note that this could be research, not just on etiology, all the way up to dissemination implementation science, okay? I wanna highlight something. Um, yes, we really value the full range of career levels. This is not to discourage graduate students, undergraduates from presenting at symposia. We want to encourage representation of presenters across the span in symposia. Okay, that's really important. Spotlight research presentations, I really encourage you to think about if you have a new finding, something that is going to change the field or that is hot off the press or contradicts existing findings in our field, that would be a good spotlight research presentation submission. And really, it's a you get 45 minutes with 15 minutes for questions. Um, and it's data that really in a 15 minute symposia presentation, it doesn't do it justice. Um, so please, please, please think thoroughly about, you know, what would fit under this. And then we all know and love our poster sessions. Those are very crucial and a great opportunity for people to present pilot data, to present, um, you know, things that haven't fully come to fruition. Or um, if you want to do a quick presentation, that's a way to, to showcase. Um, all right. So. We've talked about kind of a, uh, an overview of the different types of presentations. I want to go back to those new demographic diversity questions and just show them to you. Um, and again, this is all online in the submission portal. You can go in today. I have like a test submission that I can later withdraw to play with it. You could totally do that. So what we're asking is about the presenter's career stage, and we offer um, all the way from undergraduate to multiple options. And if you've noticed, um, in every category, you can select prefer to self-describe, and we give you a text box to write in if something doesn't fit. And all responses have the option to also answer prefer not to answer. Presenter's work setting, we really want to capture, you know, the the representation of multiple perspectives and work settings at ABCT, you can click more than one because we all know that not everyone works just in one setting. You can also self-describe if you prefer to do that. We um, include a presenter's discipline question, a presenter's work for focus, really, um, where you have the opportunity to um, enter. No worries, Katie, sounds good. Thanks for being here. Um, where you can enter what percentage of your time as a presenter you engage in research, teaching, um, and clinical service, roughly. You can also leave it blank if you want. And finally, our demographic diversity questions. You can select as many or as little or none as you want. This is really important because when you think of it, we're not just one thing. And also, when we capture these data, it doesn't, we, we got to think about significance, right? 
So really what we're hoping to understand is representation of sexual gender minorities, persons with disabilities, racial and ethnic minorities in this country of residence, and to be mindful that when we ask that, are you a racial minority, ethnic minority? Think about what that means for a person who's a majority in their country. And the reason they're being called minoritized is because they've moved to the United States of America. So we're trying to like really be sensitive and mindful of language here and what it means to be asked these questions for minoritized individuals. We also um, want to learn about, um, are you an immigrant in the country of resident? Is English a second language? Or do you identify as woman, female? Because we know that traditionally, um, A, underrepresented, and B, um, we, we need these data to make changes. Um, religious minority, international presenter, um, prefers to self-describe. We also include an option for, yes, I identify as one or more of these, but I prefer not to tell you which ones, not a problem, and then prefer not to answer. And the final question is really, really important that everyone listens here and that you read it carefully. We're not asking you to check which SIGs you belong to. We're asking you to check based on the titles of the SIGs, even if you don't belong to them, hey, I think this presentation would really be of interest to these SIGs. For example, if I'm presenting data on the prevalence of substance use in Puerto Rican youth after Hurricane Maria, I think the addictive behavior SIG might be interested in that. I also think that perhaps um, the Latinx Hispanic SIG would be interested in that. So you can indicate what might really fit with a particular audience so that we can convey this information to SIGs when they advertise presentations that might be of interest for their membership. The other thing that I wanna highlight here, and again, this is all online. I just wanna be fully transparent about it. And you saw it here first is um, that please submitters read the instructions carefully. You look at that arrow at the bottom, okay? Keep in mind that these background questions, you are not emailing your presenters and saying, hey, we gotta fill these out, just send me the answers and I'll enter them for you. Think, think research hat for a second, right? Like, are we giving privacy, confidentiality, autonomy, decisions to say no? And also there might be power differentials. Think of you as a professor asking your student to send you their multiple identities when perhaps they have never disclosed that they are identified as XYZ, right? So we wanna be mindful. Luckily our submission portal gives us a way to do that. So whenever um, you see at the bottom right corner there, Test, test, imagine Cestro Saura Orengo Aguayo. And um, you click invite so and so. And that generates an email. They get it. They can choose whether to complete it or not. This will not hold your presentation, um, meaning if they don't complete it, you can still submit. Um, and also um, know that uh, if you have any questions with this, um, please, uh, I'll give you an email um, where you can reach out, okay? We have a question here from Gabriela. Would love to hear how to get involved in reviewing submissions, if that's a possibility. Oh, yes, absolutely, Gabriela. Um, if you can um, email the email we have at the end. Um, I'm not so sure if we, maybe we can include you still for this year, um, but if not, we'll definitely include you for next year, okay? But thank you. And absolutely, transparency is the name of the game. That's how we achieve representation. All right. Finally, let me show you the new questions. It's not rocket science. We just give you, like, here's a theme. Here's what we're looking for. Could you please describe, if, you know, in any way this your presentation aligns with the themes and why? Be honest. If it doesn't, it doesn't. This is just one of seven ratings that I'll be showing you. We, I had a really... Um, important and thought-provoking discussion with an ABCT member um, where she said, Rosara, honestly, like for the future, should we consider this a yes, no question? And should it be factored into quality ratings when ABCT is about the science? Why do we have to be limited by convention theme? I think that's a legit point. Um, and that's something that I'll be passing on to 2023 for discussion. Absolutely. Right. For this year, I do think we need to move towards 
allowing submitters to tell us why, not assuming as reviewers when we read their abstracts. Also note the convention theme, anything goes this year, because guess what? Mental health has been declared a public disaster health emergency in the United States and the world. So if you do mental health research, you are part of this convention and it will relate. You just wanna hear a little bit more of which, which cool gap you fill with your work, okay? Second thing, contributing theme, team. Okay, this is new, this might flop, this might not work. I just wanna fully acknowledge this. This might irritate some people, we might eliminate next year. I just wanna invite you right now to be willing to try, okay? We're masking submissions. So this is the only way to know, is this team, does they have some sort of expertise they bring to the table and are they diverse and represent diverse voices? So what we want you to provide is a brief de-identified description of the expertise of your contributing team. And I give you an example, okay? And this example is not meant to communicate um, that research, you know, R1 institutions are better than R2 institutions. This is just an example, okay? And this is where I want my blind spots to be acknowledged and for folks to give me feedback for, for, to pass on for next year. You would write something like this, and it needs to be short and to the point. This presentation, this is an example, brings together senior academic investigators from R1 institutions. We've published extensively. You can give data on that. We've received grants. You can give data on that. And I'm being joined by two early career authors from different institutions and one clinician with over 10 years of experience delivering this treatment in this setting and who trains for us. That to me is a very strong four on a zero to four team. Diverse voices, diverse career stages, diverse expertise could really speak to this topic on, in this case, suicide, okay? So think through how you can convey this without releasing pronouns and names, because we won't be using those. Why? Because if we want the best science available, we need to give opportunities for all voices to be represented, not just big names, not just big name institutions, um, because those biases play a role in decisions, whether we like it or not. And finally, you get to write in how your presentation relates to ABCT's goals, which everyone can speak to one of the, the five strategic goals. If you're, if you're presenting at ABCT, you meet one of these, just tell us how, okay? All right. Yes, um, I have a question. To help with de-identification, should we advise SIG members to write their abstracts differently? I know that for symposia, I typically write Dr. X will say this, Dr. X will write, excellent question. Um, this is really helpful. I, had, I have to admit that's a blind spot I had. I did not consider it. Yes, de-identify. So that will no longer, a name will no longer get you bonus points. What will get you bonus points is what does that name bring? Um, presenter one comes from uh, extensive history of XYZ grants and publications in the area of XYZ and will be presenting on XYZ. Um, and Alex, that's a really good point that the example might be intimidating um, and kind of signal that you need a big name on the submission to be competitive. Um, Steven, quick question for you, you're here. Do we still have time to edit that example if I send a different example? Yep. Okay. Alex, um, if, if you can shoot, like send me an email with a suggestion, I would really appreciate it. Sounds like we still have time to change the example. Um, cause that's not what I want to convey or we want to convey. Absolutely. It's a really good point. And finally, number four, um, there's this um, acknowledgement and it's, it's, it's important for all of us to recognize. Thank you, Alex. I really, really appreciate it. Um, anyone who wants to send an example of this is how I would word that differently, um, please do so. Here is my personal, not personal email, my work email. Um, I'm just going to include it now in case you want to email it now. Okay, last thing. This is a convention that ends on Sunday. Sunday is part of our agreement with the hotel. Our like we need presentations on Sundays. However, 
we acknowledge this past trend of diversity related topics to be overrepresented on Sundays. Um, I distinctly remember one of my presentations being such a panel and two people showing up because the other 40 were at the other diversity panel that was competing with the same slot that I wanted to attend but couldn't because it was at the same time. That I am sure is unintentional. Our, our committee works really hard. The logistics of scheduling this is, is crazy. Um, it, it is an, a remarkable and it's the blind spot that perhaps was unintentional, but we need to fix. So programs chairs will be working closely with our convention um, team to make sure that there's equal representation of diversity topics across the days and in more desirable slots. Because for two reasons, it's the right thing to do. And two, um, we really can't leave our discussions about DEI issues to the trend of 2020 and 2021. This cannot be a trend. It has to be the reality of our field. So that is my commitment to everyone who's listening and our team. Whew. I am um, like realizing this was a lot, but you'll get access. I won't have time to go into all the criteria. Y'all, so this is the criteria. This is the review criteria. We've revised it from last year. It follows pretty much NIH SAMHSA protocol in addressing significance, approach, innovation, inclusion of diverse populations. This is specific to ABCT, appropriateness to convention theme, relevance to mission and goals. They're all zero to four and contributing team. I'm not gonna have time to go into it, but I will say reviewers will be getting a video and a guide to how to use these and clinical round table uh, spotlights and clinical round tables will have different wording because some, it's the same categories, but the wording needs to be changed because clinical round tables are not necessarily about discussing papers, right? And spotlights require a question about, is this a good fit with that format? So we will be making those public Public shortly, I ask for grace. For now, I give you the symposia and poster criteria for you to review so that when you submit, you know what's expected and you know what's being rated and it's fully transparent and everyone's on the same page. We want the best of the best and this is a way to get it. Um, now I'm gonna move into the review process, which I think is important for all members to know, regardless of whether you review or not, this is it. You know, the program committee is usually assembled between December and February, okay? We have SIG submit names of folks that they are ABCT members um, and who hold a terminal degree, meaning in their field, they have a terminal degree. And um, we get these names. We send a survey soliciting if you're interested in participating. And if they are, they fill a survey indicating their areas of expertise, topics, um, and that they agree to certain deadlines and procedures. Currently, we have about 213 reviewers that have um, accepted this charge. We're waiting about 14 to renew their memberships because you have to be an ABCT member. Thank you, Stephen, for those data. Um, each reviewer gets assigned around 15 to 22 submissions historically, depending on how many submissions we got and how many reviewers we have. So Gabriela, we want you on the team and hopefully you can join um, and anyone who's interested. Um, symposia, clinical roundtables, panel spotlights, all get assigned three reviewers to independently review and score. Posters get assigned two reviewers to independently review and score. We have this thing called super reviewers, which basically is someone who says, I'm willing to review in any topic that comes up if you need an extra reviewer. And then we have reviewers who say, I can do mental health disparities and trauma. That's my expertise. Um, this year, new thing, what will be new this year is um, assistance for reviewers to score and to really understand the criteria and what is the difference between a two and a three or a three and a four, for example, for the different criteria. So we're all trying to reduce bias there. All submissions will be masked. That's really important. And then contributing team will be what helps you rate that expertise of the team, that question. Um, reviewers can still disclose conflicts of interest. This is important. It came up in the town hall. This does not mean 
that if you see data that is clearly from your lab, your friend's lab that you co-authored a pub on, you, you will know, you will recognize that that's a conflict. So you can submit a conflict of interest for that and recuse yourself from reviewing that and we will reassign that. Um, so please know you can still exercise your conflict of interest as a reviewer um, if you do not feel like you would provide an objective review. It's very important. Um, as a reminder, you submissions are accepted until like, think March 7th. I want everyone to think like March 7th is my last day, but technically because it's due at, we want to be inclusive of all coasts, right? It's not necessarily fair that East Coast got until midnight, but you know, that meant Pacific had to turn it in way earlier. So Pacific gets midnight, Central gets um, the 2 a.m. and uh, East Coast gets 3 a.m. Um, but that's when the portal closes. So just think March 7th. I just wanna make sure I submit that before midnight, okay? Um, reviews will occur between March 16th and April 13th. So if you're a reviewer listening to me, Mark your calendars, you'll be getting more data soon. You have about a month. And decision emails are usually sent around May 20th, but Stephen informs me we this is fluid, like plus or minus a few days. It just depends on reviewers getting things on time so that we can um, make a decision, et cetera, okay? I wanted to share our 2022 program decision process. Like to me, this is showing my data analytic plan. I'm being transparent about it. This is how we're going to roll. I welcome feedback. Um, my, my program co-chair, Emily Thomas, truly is the stats guru among the team. And I wish she could have been here, but unfortunately she sends her regards. This is what she sent me. I'm going to leave it there in your slides because I have to move on. But what I want to say is this is our a priori approach and you have it here and it's data driven. Um, traditionally, perhaps some program decisions have been made on representation of topics. We're gonna to base it more on, um, you know, who makes that above 75th percentile in the ratings across reviewers. And we're gonna look at above the median, but only if we need to fill in representation of topics. This may mean that if your SIG doesn't encourage members to submit, they might be underrepresented because we have limited presentations available to rate. So please, please encourage, if you want your topics to be represented, we need submissions and we need them to be based on the quality ratings we're giving you with that in mind. Okay, that's really important. Very, very important. So next steps, and we'll open it up for discussion. Please log into the ABCT portal. I'm gonna show it to you real quick. I'm gonna stop sharing and switch for a second real quick. Thank you for your grace. This is what it looks like, y'all. Um, how did I get here? ABCT.org, convention, preparing to submit an abstract, clicked. You get this, okay? Please, please, please check this out. Some helpful tools and tips for submission that we've prepared for you, screenshot guides. Don't gloss them over. Please look at them if you can. I'm gonna log in. And this is what you see first. You can click here to create a new submission. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna use the one I've been using. Look at all the tests I've been doing. <laughs> um, and these are your tasks. Click on everything so you know what will be asked of your team, okay? This is where you enter all that background information. This is where you submit your abstracts, your learning objectives. Remember that some types of submissions don't have these requirements, others do. So just kind of play with it. Um, and this is where the new information is being required, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing there and go back to the PowerPoint real quick. Please review the screenshot guide if possible that we've created for instructions on how to navigate the Cadmium portal. I thank Susan Kroska for the design of this. She's awesome. She's our assistant. Um, SIG leaders, please review the criteria on this PowerPoint. May it guide your sponsorships. May it help you guide your presenters on what reviewers will be looking for so that we can maximize those three and above for automatic acceptance. 
um, share this information broadly. One of the things um, Katie Balcom um, is our representative for the board. She had to leave, but she was like, Rosara, I'm part of three SIGs and I didn't get an announcement until last night from just one. So SIG leaders, please communicate to your membership that the we count on you to disseminate this information. Follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, follow us on the um, webpage so we can make sure that everyone has equal access to this information. Because if not, we're not really doing a service to our membership. Um, and then reviewers, I'll be in touch because I, I want to give you more tools and I really need you to hang tight with me because I know it's a little bit hard given the, the short turnaround. All right, I'm going to leave that up for just a second. Please scan um, this with your phone so you can access to the slides. And yes, you may share them with anyone you want. You could either email me again directly here, um, orangoaa at musc.edu, or you can email convention at abct.org. Stephen Crane monitors that and sends it to the appropriate contact person. Um, so I have one more, do I have any comments on the chat? No? Okay. So I'm gonna stop sharing real quick. I'll put that in again in a second. We have about eight minutes. Um, if, if anyone has any comments or questions, well, let me throw it out there. First question I have for folks. The SIG designated the, the cross-collaboration sponsored slot. Yay or nay? Let me repeat the proposal. Every SIG has two spots that they can submit a sponsorship. It's not obligatory. You can do so if you want. You, you don't have to. The dissemination implementation SIG is asking for a third slot to help organize a cross collaboration presentation with multiple SIGs. Um, if anyone can put in the chat, like, yay, nay to this or any comment. Any thoughts on that? Okay, Lana, sure sounds good. Anyone else have thoughts? In the absence of many, much response, um, I will take that as indifferent um, and that program can make a decision. Um, I'll open it up, I guess, for final questions or comments about today's presentation. And you can raise your hand or drop it in the chat. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, well, um, I will be, we will be sharing the recording of this. Please share this information with your team, with your um, SIG members, with anyone you know at ABCT, and thank you for your time today. I'll hang back a few minutes in case anyone wants to chat with me. Have a good day. Thank you, Shayla. Appreciate it.